right. Well, thank you all for coming back this afternoon. What a, what a great morning session it was with Sue Ellen and Kim, huh? Pretty outstanding. So thank you both for sharing your wisdom with us. It's yes. great to learn from the masters, that's for sure. Um, so this oh, afternoon, hmm? clicker, clicker, sorry. Oh yeah, we need the clicker. Um, so Mel and I will be presenting this afternoon session and Mel and I both kind of wander around and kind of present like this. So we'll be, we'll be out and about with you guys and we really want this to be an interactive session. Um, we are going to be talking about change and that was one of the things when I was with my group but right here when we were in your session this morning um, that people start, we were talking about well, how do you get people to change. Um, so we'll be talking and digging into that a lot and then also talking about work-life balance. The myth of work-life balance actually, which is kind of interesting. Um, but how to be our best in, in times of stress. Because as leaders, we need to be our best when we're trying to drive this kind of change. And so what you're going to find is this is what Mel and I put together, kind of the things that we wish we had known in the beginning. True. Um, there's some tools from the Eden Alternative, of course. If, has anybody been through the um, Leadership Pathways to Culture Change class through the Eden Alternative? Okay, so some people, so you'll recognize some of this um, from Nancy Fox's book. How about was anybody in the Eden Academy, the webinars last year? Okay, so some of this might sound sort of familiar, but it's always good to hear things a couple of times um, to process things. So do you want to add anything before we get started, Mel? Let's get going um, as soon as I figure out how to advance slides, because this is a new one for me. The green one, right, the oh. arrow. Oh. Oops, <laughs> that one? Oh, and then back. That's the back. Okay. Okay, you got it. So, embracing change. We're going to talk a lot about this because change is so hard for people, isn't it? Has anybody ever had problems trying to implement change? Yeah, and, and one of the things I didn't understand when I first started going down this road of trying to drive change in my community is how hard it would be. I really, I'm, I thought, how, how hard could it be to change a nursing home? <laughs> it was really, really hard. And so, so some of you who are here, is it, who in here, is, this is your first introduction to the Eden Alternative. I know we've got a number of, awesome. Wow. Love having you guys here. So it's, it's really important for any of us, and especially if you're starting out on this journey, to, to understand it's gonna be hard. And I'm not, we're not gonna lie to you and say it's going to be easy, but I can tell you, and I know Mel will agree, it is the best journey you could ever go on. It will be worth it, no matter how hard it is. But it's important to understand. Research shows 70% of change initiatives fail. Isn't that, that's a huge number, isn't it? And it's a little bit scary, but what we're going to talk about is how to be in that 30%. Because there is nothing worse than introducing that this can be different to people and then not following through on it, right? It's like giving somebody a gift and then taking it away. So we all need to be really prepared to start to drive this change. I was swishing. Okay, do you want to add something about that? <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Swisher. Can you hear me? Now? Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. well, now I can. Um, I love the first slide we had where it said, I can't do it. You don't have to go back. But there's a scissor cutting it off. Because I think sometimes we focus on that I can't and that 70% fail. But look at this. You can hit it again because it's animated. 30% succeed. Right? We want to be in that 30%. Where, when you put your energy into something, that's what you get. You, you know, if you think you can and you think you can't, you're right. Right? So be in that 30%. That's where we're going to focus our energy on I can do it. We will do it, right? Take it away. All right, so this is a depiction of what it's, this is my puppy. This is Higgins von Barkensnort. That is his name that I gave him. Doesn't it sound regal? I can assure you he is not a regal puppy. He's quite a goofball. But this is what we can sometimes experience when we ask people to change. I was asking Higgins to try something new. Can we hit play? Come on, let's go. Uh oh. 
Come on, you can do it. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. You got it. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Grumbling the whole way. Come on. <laughs> and that is how it goes, isn't it? <laughs> we say, let's do this, let's change this, and people start, rawr, 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 rawr. <laughs> and as he started to go down the stairs and learn that new thing, he grumbled the whole way, and then he stopped again, and that's how the process went. But eventually, now Higgins von Barkensnort can run down the stairs and then slide across the floor and run into the wall. So, so it's kind of like that leaf on the tree, right? I want to hold on forever because change is really hard for people. So it's, it's, we're going to talk today about getting to the root of what that's all about and helping people to get on board with it. And you know, it is really hard. It, this is not, no one ever told you, and we are not going to tell you that this is an easy thing. But like Jill said, it's so worth it. But you need to talk about it in a way that helps people understand your, you need to inspire them. They're seeing geese, they've seen geese forever. You want them to see the fish, right? You need to help them have that shift, that mental shift that says, I can do this, we can do this. You need to engage them. Share that mission with passion, right? And it's in, sometimes it's in the way we say things that really makes the difference. It's not always our words, it's sometimes our words, but it's how you say your words, right? So you need to empower them and inspire them. So like this is a life skill, I think, this whole way we present things. And I'm gonna share with you a story um, I have, a, I have two beautiful young ladies. I'm blessed to be their mom. And they're grown, of course. But my one daughter, she's a single mom now. And I'll say, let's go do something. And she'll say, Ma, I'm broke. I can't. And I've heard this a lot. Mom, I can't. I'm broke. And I said, you know, honey, we need to work on that. Because you're giving the control away. Okay. So how about if we rephrase that? How about if you say, you know, Mom, I choose to spend my money in other ways. And of course, she looked at me like I had six heads. <laughs> she said, OK, I choose to spend my money on rent and food for my son. I said, good, you took control. That's your decision, and you're in control of it. It's the same thing with what we're doing. We need to give the control to the people we're with. We need to say it in an empowering way that gives them the control. They need to see the why and understand their role in that goal, right? If I don't know what my part is, I'm not gonna come along. So we need to use some good words. And one of the handouts, and that's the one you may have to ask me to email you, but there's one that says some transformative language. So somebody was asking me last week, well, what are you doing next week? Well, I have to go to the conference and then I was like, no, I get to go to the conference. I get to present with these awesome people. I mean, that's a privilege. It's not I have to. How do we get our teams to say, I get to do this with enthusiasm? That's what we need. So there's some other things here. You know, we, we hear them. We've always done this. Well, how about let's try this. But you have to put some bounce in it, right? Um, when we're documenting, there's just several of them here. When we're documenting, she refused, right? No, she chose not to do this or she chose a different option and we supported her in it, right? So we really have to work on language. Kim and Sue Ellen talked about language this morning. We have to work with language. It's what changes people's perceptions. Um, there's another one I just want to share because I'm very, very passionate about ageism and ableism. And I even heard it yesterday, the silver tsunami. Okay? What is a tsunami? It's all about destruction, right? It's horrible, it's terrible. That's not what's happening. 
okay? We have a changing aging demographic, okay? We do need to look at it, we need to plan for it, we need to deal with it, but it's not this tsunami, this horrible thing. So think about how we, how we approach our, our folks. Absolutely. Great points, thank you. So one of the things that I've learned over time, has anybody else, is anybody else part of Leading Age? Here, so some people are. So I had the great opportunity to go through the Leading Age Leadership Academy a couple of years ago, and we spent, spent a whole year diving into um, adaptive leadership, okay? And so has anybody ever heard that term before? Adaptive leadership, okay, so, so you guys jump in if I'm missing some things on this. But here's the thing, we are really good at technical fixes in our field, okay? Surveyors come in. Are there any surveyors, any of the surveyors here? Oh man, okay, yay, yay. awesome. <laughs> So I, I think ideally the surveyors want this whole approach to be an adaptive approach where, where we're going deep. But a lot of times what happens is we get, our, we get our statement of deficiencies and we write up bing, 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 here's what we're gonna do, we send it in, right? And they say, okay, we'll send us your documentation to prove it so we can do a desk review. We check things off, boom, boom, boom. Technical fixes, checking the boxes. Now the ideal situation is it's adaptive and it goes much deeper, but a lot of times that's how we think, okay? But there's a big difference, okay? And what we are talking about here with culture change, with the Eden alternative, is an adaptive challenge. And this is based on the work of, of Ronald Heifetz. And so technical problems, I just wanna go through this, what, what the difference is, okay? So, so technical problems, and I'll, let me give you an example, okay? Because this applies in, in life, too. So my husband, a few years ago, otherwise very healthy, started having terrible, terrible pain. He couldn't get out of bed in the morning because his feet hurt and his knees hurt and everything was just terrible all of a sudden. And he went to the doctor and he knows I tell this story all the time, just so you know. This is not a HIPAA violation. Um, he went to the doctor and they, after all these tests, they diagnosed him with rheumatoid arthritis. So the doctor says there are a couple of options here, okay? We've got technical, basically, is what the doctor is saying, technical solutions, which is, which would be what? Medication and injections, okay? We've got technical solutions for you, and then there's some adaptive work that you could do and make life changes, okay? And David has met my husband, um, which means, so adaptive, what, anybody, what, if somebody had rheumatoid arthritis, what are some um, changes you can make in your life? Your diet, exercise, stress management, sleeping, right? All those things. Which do you think my husband did? <laughs> Medication, injections, that's what we all do, right? Because we are programmed, our brains are programmed to find the easy solution, in, okay? So technical problems, easy to identify, they have quick and easy solutions, okay? You just improve your existing practices. It can happen sometimes with survey. You know what, all we need to do is change the way we do report, or all we need to do is change the way we do our care plans, bam, 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 we're done. They can be solved by an authority or an expert. So that doctor saying, here's your diagnosis and here's what you should do. Or you call, have a consultant come in and say, here's what you need to fix. Change is only required in one or two places, so it's really simple. Medications, remember to take your medication in the morning go in once a month and have an injection. Um, people are usually really receptive to technical solutions, right? Just like my husband's like, okay, that's not so hard. I don't have to make big changes in my life. And solutions can be implemented really quickly. So you got new policies, new procedures, make things work, okay? Adaptive challenges, on the other hand, which is what all of this that we're talking about is, are difficult to identify. So it's really hard to put your finger on what the real problem is because it's kind of squishy, right? And they're really easy to deny. We don't have a problem with our culture here. We're fine. It's really easy to, to, to say we don't have a problem. They re to address these things, you have to change the way people think, the way they believe about things, the roles, the relationships, the way you approach everything that you do. The people with the problem have to do the work of solving it. So it can't be you know, the administrator saying, this is how we're gonna fix it, because it won't work. 
It's a lot of what, what you all were talking about this morning. Um, change is required throughout the whole organization. If you really want change to stick, you have to dig deep and it has to be fixed everywhere. And here's the really important thing, expect resistance. Why would we expect resistance when we're doing this adaptive work? People, yeah, it's hard. It's really hard work. And it requires a lot of experimentation and discovery over a long period of time. What experimentation leads to what? Failures and mistakes and people don't like that. Okay, so in, in, in my world, um, when I was uh, running a nursing home, before we had, when we had just gotten started on the Eden journey, we were concerned because the elders, the residents that lived in our community, we didn't feel like they had great relationships with all the team members, and we didn't feel like the team members were really engaged. And so, we came up with this program called the Guardian Angels, <laughs> okay? And so guardian angel program was every single team member would be assigned to a resident and then you'd go do nice stuff with them, okay? And my community, we went so far as to have like checklists. Did you go see Mrs. Smith today? Okay, check it off. What did you do? How, how do you think that worked? It failed miserably. Why? We turned it into a task. We were, in, in exactly, it was a strategy, not a change in our culture. And so we were trying to say this was a technical problem, but it was an adaptive challenge. And, and so that doesn't work. And it wasn't until like a year later, and one of my team members said, this is the most institutional approach to trying to fix the institution I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that is so true. And so we started thinking about that, and what do you think happened when we started doing deep cultural transformation? It happened naturally. Yeah, we didn't have to have assigned people. So did, can, did anybody else have that happen in their organization? So give me an example. You did the same thing. It's a common thing, right? Because checklists make us happy, and assigning people to things make us happy, right? Anybody else do that? Yep, every, we, yep. So the administrator telling you, you need to go do this, you need to go that, it turns into a task. It doesn't have deep meaning. We're not making real and deep sustainable change. Um, so if you have something you've been trying to address and trying to address and trying to address and you can't seem to fix it, it's highly likely that it's an adaptive challenge that you're trying to use a technical approach to fix. Does anything pop into anyone's, anyone's mind? Diet and exercise. Do we, do we have a mic we could use to, like a? They were up there, but they're not. Oh, OK. Because I'd love to get some thoughts going here. So I heard diet and exercise. <laughs> yeah, who struggles with that, right? Thank you. If I use my fitness pal and I write everything down in there, it helps. But anything else anybody can think of? Something you keep trying and trying and trying to fix and you're, it's not working? No, you guys, everything works when you try to fix it? <laughs> you guys are amazing. We have a mic. Okay. Teenagers not listening. Well, I, so <laughs> I, that was my teenager. You saw the little dog coming down the stairs, so I know nothing about that. I've got um, a 14 and an 18 year old, and you know, no matter what I tell them to do, they just don't do it. They just do not do it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. We don't like people telling us what to do, right? Yeah, that's right. So if you take, and so if you take nothing else away from today, please remember that. The technical, being able to identify technical problems and adaptive challenges is key to driving this forward. Okay, and this is available online. If you just um, Google, adaptive leadership or adaptive versus technical challenges, you'll find all kinds of information on this. Um, there's actually a book, um, Ronald Heifetz wrote, Leadership Without Easy Answers. It's like a textbook, so it's really kind of a heavy read, but there are a lot of summaries of it out there. Um, really, really great stuff to, 
to start to dig into, because that's a major problem that we have, trying to fix things the way we always fix things. And we, we have to go deep and we have to, to make significant change throughout the organization. So change resistance comes when the loss you ask people to incur outweighs the perceived purpose. So anytime you ask people to change, you're asking them to take a loss. You're asking them to give up something. Okay, so has anyone had the experience of trying to implement change and you have, and I'm not, I'm not, I have to pick on nurses a little bit because we have a lot of really experienced nurses in our communities and this isn't, it could be anybody with a lot of years of experience. And so you have somebody who's been working in the field for forever and they're the ones that are, and you know they're awesome, but they're like, oh heck, heck no, we're not doing this. Has anybody ever had that happen? Okay, so what do you think you're asking that nurse to give up by asking her to change and have the medical model not drive everything and to do things differently? Her 30 years of experience. What else could you be asking people to, to give up? Control. Control. Their edu who said education? What, what do you mean by that, Angie? Here. Yeah, will you repeat that? I don't know if I break. We'll get you the mic. Sorry. Mel's going to get some steps. I told yeah. you you wanted to speak before. <laughs> I said because her, everything that led up to her career, her education and background was based on a medical model of care. And yes. so she invested in that education, and now we're telling them that that's not the best way. Exactly. Yeah. So everything that this, per this person's identity, right? You're asking the person to give up their identity. Did anybody have a mentor that taught them when they first started in this field that you like think is the most amazing person in the world? Well, so a lot of people do. And when you ask people to change the way we're doing things, it's like saying that person that you put up on this pedestal was wrong. And that's really, really painful for people to do. Okay? You're asking the, that nurse to be incompetent for a while. When I was trying to um, change a large nursing home in Colorado, I was a new administrator there, and it was, there were 168 elders at this community, and it was really institutional. And the ombudsman would come to my building, and, she would, and, and, and I was trying to make things change, and she kept saying, you need to go to an Eden alternative class. You need to go to a certified Eden associate training. You need to go, you need to go. And I was never like considered myself a closed-minded person, but I kept putting it off. And it wasn't until later I realized, you know, I, I, was a, I was a good administrator in the institutional model. I had good surveys and good financial things going on and, you know, things were going okay. I knew when I went to that training, it would change everything and I would have to be incompetent for a while. So has anybody, anybody experienced anything like that? So give me, Sue Allen, give me. Sort of the very same thing when I looked at my style of leadership and realized I had to change it from this kind of top down where I knew stuff to now being a coach that I had no skills to do. I was an expert and I became a beginner and it was scary. Yeah. Yes, it's really scary. It's really scary and we're gonna talk I, don't, I think it might be a little bit later in the presentation about how we need to start celebrating incompetence, which I never thought I would ever say. I used to fire people for that. Um, but this is critical to understand when we are introducing change to people is, is stopping and thinking, what am I asking this person to give up? Okay, because if, if what they're afraid of giving up is bigger, then what they think the benefit's going to be from it, they're gonna push back. Okay, so there's two parts to this. It's, it's understanding what they're, you're asking them to give up and helping to minimize that fear that they have. And then it's also making sure the vision and that where we're going is big enough so that they know it's worth going through that scary time of I don't know what I'm doing. I'm giving up all, everything I knew for the last 30 years of my career, so it's worth it to do it. Does that make sense? 
And this was something I didn't learn until like two years ago. And I'm like, oh, I wish I had known this a long time ago. I could have saved a, a lot of angst for everyone. So there's a few really good books. Um, has anybody ever read with Start With Why? It's a great book for change leadership. Um, Switch, How to Change Things When Change is Hard. Has anybody read that? Oh my gosh, okay, you have to go get that book. It, it's fantastic, and, it will, and it's, very, it's a very interesting read as well, and it will help you start to understand how do you drive sustainable change. Um, and so, and then the, the Heifetz book on leadership without easy answers, which is all about adaptive leadership. Again, that is a tough book to read. I recommend finding summaries of it, but I hope I never run into Ronald Heifetz. <laughs> I heard his book sales, but he's brilliant, but it's just, it's pretty heavy. Um, so from these books, some kind of basic steps are first acknowledge that loss. And even sitting down with that person that's kind of like, you start talking about, hey, I went to the Eden Alternative Conference, and the person starts doing this. There's that crazy administrator. She went off to another conference and she's coming back with something else kooky. Is sitting down with that person and talking about what does this change mean? What makes you nervous about it? What scares you? Okay? And being able to hear that and help people, help work, that person work through it. Appealing to the emotion, and in the book, Start uh, Switch, they, they call it the elephant and the rider. And actually, Nancy Fox in her latest book talks about this. But it's appealing to that emotion. It's why the Eden Alternative says you have to open hearts before you can open minds. Right. Okay, so if you go in and say, um, what's something somebody just did recently as a culture change? Something you've changed recently? Or you want to? Nobody? Nobody wants to change? Whoops. You changed dining? Okay, Whoops. what'd you guys do in dining? Yep. I had a run. Mm. Okay. Here. Say it again. So now our care partners, they, uh, we provide meals to our employees, and so they actually serve all the elders, and then they get their food and sit down with them. And it kind of solved two problems because they were complaining that the food, you know, wasn't as good, you know, an hour after it was made. They didn't, you know, so it solved that problem. Um, but also, more importantly, just the relationships and the bonds you know they're creating by actually sharing a meal together so it's worked out one and we had some hesitations but we implemented it on that shift because we thought that would be the easiest and uh -huh. it's increased elders coming to the dining room that's and, awesome but yeah so it's worked out great so when you did that what was the emotional appeal to your team what was the why behind it be because it was a better way, it was the right thing to do, it was a better way to do things. It made it feel more like home. And it was a CNA Care Partners idea. Oh, wow, that's, so that's that, good, you know, that's awesome. It's great to be able to implement that and actually work and be successful, so. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's awesome, so I think she's really, she's really proud about it too, and you know, has really. Yeah, when it comes from, yes, shirt. right. yes, yeah. absolutely. So. And, and so for, for, for that team member to get to that place of coming up with um, this idea, you did a lot of work of appealing to the hearts of the people in your community, right? Yes, yes. And she actually thought about it, it came up with it during the first Eden class that I took. Oh, that's awesome. And the only, the first and only. <laughs> that's, <laughs> the a, three that's, class. Yeah. that's huge. So. You, got, you need to teach again. <laughs> that is huge. So if you start going in and saying, um, well, you know what? Um, we're going to get rid of overhead, overhead paging, and you don't talk about the why, people are just going to be like, why, why would we do that? How are we going to communicate? But if you talk about it and you do some, so part of appealing to the emotion is having people experience things sometimes. So, you know, uh, overhead paging. So let's go and sit in, a, in an elder's room for an hour and see what it's like having this bombard, bombardment of noise, right? Um, because people have to get it, they have to feel it in their gut, they have to feel it in their heart before being able to do that hard work to make things change. Um, same thing with, has anybody, <laughs> the, 
This is one of the hardest things to do, and it always makes me laugh, but getting rid of scrubs. It's like the world has come to an end because where am I going to put my pens, right? <laughs> but when you, start, when you start with, we want this to be home, and having people run around in scrubs looking like this is a medical institution doesn't feel like home, people start to go, oh, okay, I wouldn't want to live that way either. I wouldn't want to live with overhead paging and, and this and that and all these things. So people start to understand it, okay? Um, one of the things when I was trying to change one of my communities, um, and I, it was a new community where I was starting, and I knew there were problems, and I didn't know if my boss would get it, and I knew I needed resources to make things change, so I stayed in the nursing home as a resident, and then I wrote her this report with the gut-wrenching, heartbreaking stuff about sleep deprivation and being, you know, woken up at five o'clock in the morning, pushed out in the hallway to sit there and, I mean, I, I, feeling like you're nothing and you're nobody. And when she called me and she, she said, you made me cry. I knew I had her. <laughs> so finding that way to have people feel it in their, in their gut and in their heart is so important. And we talk a lot about, people always want to know what's the business case for culture change. Right? What's this going to get me? What's this going to get me in terms of outcomes, occupancy? Which you have to have, right? And we've got great data to show all the great outcomes that come from the Eden Alternative. But if you don't go, if, if there's an organization and they're only doing it to make their bottom line better, how do you think, how well do you think that journey's going to go? Not very, because you, <laughs> you have to have it in here to do this hard work. So you've got to have both. The appeal to the intellect is how do we get this done? And here's what this looks like. And here's what the outcomes will be. Okay, so you've got to have it all. Sometimes we miss that and we just do one or the other. If we don't speak the intellect side of it and how do we get there and what does this mean and what does it look like for training and budgets, you also aren't going to get anywhere. Because you, you probably have people in your organization that are making the decisions about money and resources. So get really good at understanding what's the emotional side, what's the intellectual side. And then give the work back to the people, okay? Mary just talked about the, the CNA who came up with that, that great idea to just have, hey, let's have dinner with the elders. That's where the magic happens, right? So anybody, another, give me, somebody else give me an example of what happens when you give the work back to the people. The people, the elders are those closest to them, we say in the Eden Alternative. Okay, um, it's probably been maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, I started working at Sparta Health and Rehabilitation as an activity coordinator. So when I went in, we had maybe five activities for the community where the dementia patients were, are, and on the main dining room, we had maybe four or five there. So surprisingly, the Fed showed up. And they asked me about the activities on the weekends and the activities that were going on when I got off work. I told her they were being done, and she asked me for the documentation. The documentation was there, but the ones that actually performed the activities did not put their signatures on it. Mm -hmm. So we came up yeah. with a way of doing the activities when I was not there with the CNAs doing it. And it was individualized activities which they were doing anyway, they just weren't getting credit for it. So I came up with the individualized activities and it wasn't successful. It was until my administrator, Ms. Ann Devereaux, said to me, Donna, go to them and ask them, what do they do with them individually that works for them? Mm -hmm. And then write that down as individualized activities. That's when it became a success. Absolutely. Because so. they owned it. Yep, yep. yep. Yeah, nobody wants to have these mandates in corporate, hey, you're gonna do this, because it never sticks. To make, and you can make that happen if, it's, if, you, want, if you have a technical challenge, right? You can do, implement a new whatever, I don't know, uh, check request form. That's pretty easy. You don't need to have like a million people involved in that, but when you need to do that adaptive work, you've got to give the work back to the people who know best, which is the people who are closest to the elders, right? And earlier, I, I loved what Sue Ellen said when she said, we, the path, uh, 
We lay the path as we walk it. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing with this. You don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step. And that was one of the things that held me up when I first started on this journey, is I thought I had to have everything figured out because we're also very good at that in our field, right? Well, first we're gonna do, and strategic planning, well, this we're gonna do first and then we're gonna do the second, and you have to have some of that. But with this journey, you have to lay the path as you walk it. And if you wait until you have everything figured out, you are never going to get started. Angie, are you ever going to get started? If you, Angie, I worked with um, from uh, AG Rhodes Cobb here in Marietta, Georgia for a year. And, and in the beginning, you guys wanted to have everything figured out because they are a deficiency-free home and have been for three years, which is amazing, right? And so. Man, that team, they, they have their act together. And they wanted to have everything planned out of what are we gonna do first and what are we gonna do second? And it's paralyzing, right? It so you had to just start taking the first step. And then that first step leads you to the mm -hmm. next step and then you get more comfortable and things start to happen. So don't let yourself get paralyzed. I, just, I wasted a lot of time thinking I had to have everything figured out in the beginning. And sometimes you want to add something? Yeah. No, some, you can click it. Sometimes you don't know what that first step is going to be either. And for anyone um, who's taken leadership pathways, you might have learned about this, but how many people know what the broken window theory is? Okay, you want to wanna share it? That will be easier I, I coming from you. I can be your mic person. You can be my mic person? Yes. Thank you. Of course. Okay. Isn't this where the theory is, if there is a broken window or graffiti, if we hurry up and clean it up and make it beautiful, then it goes away. It happened in New York City subway stations. They couldn't figure out how to control the graffiti and all the vandalism, and so rather than trying to police it, they just kept, it, kept up on it, and over time people quit vandalizing. That's, that's what it is, Heather, and what it, oh, I don't need that, no, I have no. this. <laughs> so used to walking around with it. And it, it was actually even larger than that because the crime in New York City, this is back in the 80s, and I lived there then, and I can attest, <laughs> the crimes were outrageous. So there were about 200,000 murders per year and about 600,000 felonies. It was out of control. So Kelling is one of the co-developers of this theory, and he was hired as a consultant in New York to help clean up crime. You know what he started with? Graffiti. Graffiti, we have murders, we have felonies. He's worried about graffiti, but that's exactly what it was. So he started with the graffiti, and every car got cleaned inside and outside. And I can tell you, anybody here in New York City? Okay, aren't they? Well, they were pretty horrible. I think they're better now. But every human fluid imaginable while you're riding, people harassing you, people begging while you're going to work, right? And it smells and it's awful. So he said, we are cleaning the subway cars. And he did, inside, outside. Once they were clean, they never went back out. If they, if, if they got painted overnight, they stayed there, were repainted. And that's how they started. And 10 years later, they applied, well, less than 10 years later, they applied the same theory to the crime. And by ninth, the end of the 90s, crime had dropped. Murders were down by two thirds and felonies by a half. They started with the small things. And that's what we have to do. We, we tend to think, oh my gosh, we've got to change the world because we're so excited and we're on fire and that's great. But we can't change the world until we work with the broken windows. So what are the broken windows that you have? What are some of those little things that if you leave them to continue, they could bring that institution back, what Dr. Thomas calls dragon food? Or they may just continue to fester and have people not living their best lives, not thriving. What are some of your broken windows? Where can you start? Jill's the mic runner. <laughs> there we go. I'm getting some steps. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the common and easy areas to look at and really is a broken window is when you allow the language to sneak 
and, and those words sneak back in that are so institutional and so medical, and, and we don't stop and go, hang on, what did you just say? Right, right. Stop it and, and address it because it is a broken window. Great. That great. is a great example. A and that's one of the first things that you guys worked on. See? Right? Because you don't have to start at the top of the staircase, yeah. the broken windows. Any other broken windows you can think of? Because this seems overwhelming. Right here, everybody's on fire in conference, and you go back to your organization, and you're like, okay, what do I do? Broken windows. Awesome. Anybody? All right, who's it going to be? Because I'm just going to walk up to somebody. So you, if you there have one, go. you better save the other people. <laughs> Thank you. One that we've been on our Eden journey for quite a while, but one of the things we're working on right now is including more care partners from different areas in our meetings, like our quality assurance, our policies, yes. so that we've, we get the communication. You know, we've tried other means to communicate, but um, communicating directly, that's something that we can, we can change. Good, perfect so, example. So great. you guys get it. Oh, we got another one. All right. Sorry, and I have to come over here, I can't see. <laughs> Include your staff. Yes. Just ask them for their ideas, right. and it will flow. They'll do it for you. There you go. Include them. Right. Collaborate. And that, whoop, where'd you go? That's what our person here said, you know, get to your people. That's exactly it. So broken windows, it's a great, and that's a great read, too, the tipping point. Oh, yeah. That's another great one to add to your list. Okay. And one of the really fun things to do as a group is it, when you go back to your communities to pick a book and read it as a team and do it like a leadership book club. Extremely powerful to read something together like that and process. Right. Right. What lessons can we take away? Yes. Another lesson, um, I can't remember which book. I think this is from Switch, um, is identify what growth means, okay? What, what will you see when this change you're, you're trying to make happen? What would, it, what would that be? So um, I, I see Mary and Angie talking to each other back here, so I'm gonna pick on them. No. I'll do, so they, they identified, well, we wanna see the care partners having dinner with the residents and like just hanging out and enjoying things. So identify what does that look like and then shine the light on it and share those stories. I know Fran does a lot of that, don't you? Is, is, okay, this person's doing exactly this change I've been trying to create, I see it happening. And make a huge deal about it. One of the most powerful things to do is go up one level. So if you're the administrator, send a note to, and tell your boss, hey, I'm gonna be doing this and I need you to help me. Because it, the research shows that this really works. I'm gonna, so if I'm an administrator, then my regional person or, or whoever, I'm gonna send that person a note or call the person and say, hey, you would not believe what Mary just did today. This is awesome, and then have that person recognize her. Send her a note, call her, whatever. That stuff starts to have a ripple effect. Make a big deal out of it in resident council meetings, in team member meetings, okay? So identify, and we don't do enough of this. I don't, personally, that's a growth area for me, is finding what I wanna celebrate and then celebrate the heck out of it. Because the more you shine the light on what you wanna see, other people are gonna be like, ow, oh, and it starts to make things click for people. Anybody have an example of something they shine the light on and make a big deal about and how it spreads? I know somebody does. Awesome. There you go, John. Yes, you do, Lori. You I'm do. I'm not that loud. Mm -hmm. um, well, um, I've always had the care partners be in the care conference um, in my history. And so this is new to the folks that I'm working with since I'm new to this organization. And, uh, you know, so I think I've done, I've been there oh, right at a month. So I've probably mm -hmm. done about 20, maybe, care conferences and just reviews. That's probably too many, but regardless. Um, so people were nervous, like, oh my gosh, what's the new boss going to do and whatever. And I'm like, come on in. And, and then I start asking questions. And then they're answering all these wonderful things that the families have no idea, that I have no idea what works with this person. And then just celebrating and saying, you know, I would have never known this thing. You have just helped me create this care plan that's gonna perpetuate through the whole, all the shifts. 
Awesome. And just repeating that, and so now I'm getting people like, oh, we're going to do the care plan. I'm like, we're going to do it, and it's not scary anymore. So <laughs> Ex it's, that's it's a great twisted example. Twisted back, you know, it's kind of using the complimenting in front of other people with right. the yes. family, yes. with yes. all of mm -hmm. that, to, and also really creating a much higher quality care plan. Mm -hmm. That's that's fantastic. What a great example. Thank you for sharing that. That's exactly what we're talking about. So, so make a point, celebrate this stuff, make a huge, even if you think it's little, make a huge deal about it. Um, they, one of the other things that's in, in the Ronald Heifetz book and is, is part of the uh, adaptive leadership theory is looking at your work as being on the dance floor versus being on the balcony. Anybody ever heard that before? Yeah. Okay. So. We, and, and a lot of times we get this mixed up when we talk about servant leadership, that we, if I'm a good leader, I'm out there all the time in the inside of everything, making things happen, and we're like, I must be really good at this. But leadership requires stepping back. It does. I mean, you cannot be out there all the time. If you're never out there, hmm? Yeah, let others do it. And, and so we need to think about when you're on a dance, does anybody here like love to get out there and dance? All right, so when you're out there dancing, you're like doing your thing and you only see the people who are right there with you. But when you allow yourself to get up on the balcony, what happens if you're on a balcony overlooking a dance floor? You see everybody, you see the crazy people with the kooky dance moves. You see what you see who's standing back, who's not engaged. You see who might be like arguing with each other, whatever's going on. So making a point as a leader to get, have balcony time, because you've got to, Give yourself space to think and space to see what's going on. And, and I think sometimes we do ourselves a disservice because we think that that's not okay. If I'm a leader, then I'm in the mix all the time. Yeah, you wanna be there sometimes, but you have got to step back and see what's going on so you can see what's happening with the organization. And so a powerful thing you can do, and I just encourage you to do this the next time you're in a meeting, is like in, well, we shouldn't be sitting in stand-up, but we do. Whatever your meeting is, is you can just even push back from the table a little bit and sit back. And rather than being in it with everything, watch what's happening. And you'll start to see the body language of people and how they're acting. And you can go, huh, well, that person, something's not right. Or, yeah, that person's getting it, and these people are fighting. But you can't see it if you're in it. So give yourself permission because it's essential to have balcony time. As much as we talk about a leader's out there doing, yes, but you gotta have perspective. I don't know, do you have, I'm sure you do a lot of that, so on, because you've gotta be able to, to think and see things, right? What this leads to, and, and Ronald Heifetz talks about seeing your organization as a pressure cooker. And I love this theory so much. So a, a pressure cooker, you all know what a pressure cooker is? We don't have them very much. It's kind of like an Instapot is now, right? Yeah. Um, so if you think of your organization as a pressure cooker, what happens with a pressure cooker if you don't have any heat turned on? Nothing. Nothing. You're not going to get any results. What happens if you crank the heat up really, really high? It'll blow up. <laughs> exactly. And so it's really important to to keep an eye on that as a leader. As a leader, you are responsible for monitoring the temperature and, and driving the temperature in your organization. Okay, so you gotta know when, when, when are people, when's this thing about to explode? And I better turn the heat back a little bit. But then when are we, when is nothing cooking here? So I'll give you an example. When, at one of my communities, um, we went through five years of construction, an $80 million redevelopment project, okay? Residents, team members, I mean, we were in constant chaos for five years. Moving residents here, moving them there. All kinds of construction issues, new residents moving in, all kinds of new amenities. And by the end of those five years, everybody was exhausted, completely exhausted, as, as I was. And, I, and we had made huge progress. I mean, we did unbelievable things with our culture at the same time we were building this building. And so I was like, okay, now finally I'm gonna let these people breathe, right? I, I didn't understand this pressure cooker thing at the time. So I'm like, I'm gonna turn down the heat. These guys need to rest. And then I went to a Leadership Academy meeting and we were learning about this pressure cooker concept. 
And one of the questions the, the, lead, the coach asked is, you know, think about in your organization, when's the last time real work was done? Because what people will do, because again, our brains are trying to conserve energy, is we'll do anything to avoid that hard work of adaptive change. Mm -hmm. And so people will act like they've got all this busy stuff going on, but nothing's really changing. And I realized, oh my gosh, like I was letting this organization just sit with no heat and nothing was happening. And so I went back and I talked to the team and I said, when's the last time we really did anything significant? And they were like, oh, we haven't been. And so we had to turn the heat back up and get things moving again. One of the things to remember with the pressure cooker is if you think about relationships as the actual vessel, the stronger the relationships are, the warmer your, your culture and your climate is, the more heat it can take without exploding. If you've, got, if you've got a bunch of problems and people aren't getting along and you have a cold climate, you could turn it up a little bit and it's going to explode. So does that, does that make sense? Remember to mind the pressure cooker, and it is your job as a leader to apply heat, hmm. okay? Because we will not, people, we, will, we are just programmed to not want to do hard work because our brains, it takes a lot of energy. We're in survival mode, okay? So it's your job to keep the heat up, but also know when to turn it down. And a leader's role in times of change, this is from Nancy Fox's book, and from the uh, book, uh, Leadership Pathways to Culture Change, a leader's role in times of change, whoever's read that book, what's your role? Another role, in addition to the pressure cooker. Does anybody remember? It's calm the chaos. Calm the system. And I always, I like this picture because if you think about a really turbulent ocean with all these waves, our job as leaders is to calm that. And everybody, no matter what your job is, that's what you can do is to help your team understand Everybody plays a role in this because it's contagious when people are freaking out and, be, and, and, and like Sue Ellen said, everyone's watching her all the time. So if you're a leader, everybody's watching you and however Sue Ellen acts is how, oh, well, Sue Ellen's calm, so that must mean it's okay. Sue Ellen's acting like this is the end of the world, it must be the end of the world. Now, I doubt you ever act like that, but. And if you've ever, has anybody ever worked in a community where when the surveyors walk in the building, the administrator loses their mind? <laughs> and what does everybody else do? Everybody loses their minds. So remember that and teach other people this too. Calm the system. The folks that we work with are counting on us to help them get through this stuff, okay? more of the leader's role. <laughs> Has anyone um, take, some of you have taken certified Eden associate training, right? Have you seen the DeWitt Jones video, Everyday Creativity? Okay, and just a couple of you had taken Leadership Pathways, but there's another wonderful film we're using the art of, the art of possibility, I couldn't read it. <laughs> the art of possibility, so, DeWitt Jones is um, on the bottom, and Ben and Rosamund Zander did the other one. So they talk about living in possibility and awakening the possibility in others. Give everyone an A. Well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Look for their shiny eyes. And always talk in the realm of possibility, not in downward spirals. Change your lens. Anybody remember that one? Um, there's more than one right answer and celebrate, speaking of celebrating, celebrate what's right. So let's talk about living in possibility. This is, if, I'm sorry, let me take that from you. Thank you. So I just really love that. I love the smell of possibility in the morning. <laughs> right? Um, Ben Zander talks about, he's an, actually, he's an orchestra leader, maestro, right? And do you ever see them on the cover of magazines and they're waving their arms, right? And they look like these magical leaders, and they are. And they're the most powerful ones in the whole orchestra. You know what? They don't even play an instrument, right? So how do they get their power? They get their power from making others powerful. They have to awaken the possibility in every single musician. 
and have them own that possibility and rise up. That's how he's powerful. He's just standing there waving, right? But it's magical. It really is. And he plays not one instrument. And he says he just realized that just a couple of years ago. Um, but you need to really share the vision, again, in that way, so that everybody sees that possibility. All, everything is possible. And then give everyone an A. OK, so we work in a kind of a crazy backwards system where we bring on these care partners, and we want them to give lots and lots of TLC to the people living in these homes. Yet, we, we bring them in and we put them on probation, don't we? Who is on probation? People who are out of jail. <laughs> we don't give benefits for 90 days because we really don't believe they're going to make it. This is the way we bring people in who we want to care for the people who live here. This is insane. So Ben says, give them an A. What does that mean in this realm? People are going to live up to the expectations we have of them. If we think they're not going to make it and not worth it, what do you think we're going to get? Exactly that. They're going to live into that. What if we, what if we had them instead um, write a letter? Or, or we'll say to you, you've got this wonderful job. We're so proud of you. And in 90 days, we want you to give us a letter saying why you deserve to be here. What have you learned in these 90 days? What, what have you lived into here? Think a little bit of a paradigm shift there. Do you think we'll get better results with the people we have? Boy, if I got A's from my professors, I think I would have done a lot better starting out. So give, give them an A. Look for their shiny eyes. Dottie, look up. Look at that, Dottie. When, that's from one of my classes, and one of my people is here. So how do we, how do we get shiny eyes? What does that mean, to have shiny eyes? You've seen it. How many of you educate or train? Do you, ever, do you ever watch people have that personal transformation? And you see those shiny eyes? That's what you want. Do you see that in your, in your staff? Do you see shiny eyes? You should. And if you don't, then that's on you. It's our job as leaders to have them have shiny eyes. And you need to say to yourself, what am I doing that they don't have shiny eyes? What am I doing? OK? And then you need to go and fix it and give them those shiny eyes. So this morning, we had Karen Stoby and, um, and Mundy talking to us about yes and. And it kind of ties into this. So always talk in the realm of possibility, not downward spirals. So what does that mean? Everything in our world right now is talked about in this downward spiral, certainly in America. <laughs> Everything we see on the news. It's all bad, right? It's all negative. Nobody trusts anybody. There's blame being associated everywhere. No one has ownership of anything. Do you hear this? OK, think about in the place where you work. Isn't everything talked about? We can't do this. This isn't working. We tried this. That's all that negativity. That's where blame comes in. That's where mistrust comes in. That's where um, denial comes in. There's so much in that downward spiral. That's that being on stage in improv and saying no. Everything stops with a downward spiral. So what we need to do is go to that anything is possible. That's where the answers are. That's yes and. So instead of we can't do it, we can do it and we're going to try this. We can do it and OK, 
Okay, if someone comes to you, you have to bring them from that downward spiral. This is your job as a leader. This is my job as a leader to take them from that place of negativity to the realm of possibility. But it's hard. <laughs> it's quite hard. Let's say yes and. And I think you were talking about this before, Jill. We need to change our lens. We need to be the ones to see it from a different perspective. We always look at things, well, we, we don't, but we tend to see the same thing over and over and over, and after a while, you don't even notice that there's anything wrong anymore. It's just part of the scenery. But if we turn around and look the other way, just change our position, you might see it a whole different way. And then you need to help your people to see it. They're not going to have these paradigm shifts unless you help them to see it differently. Anybody, um, anybody have little kids, little, little ones? Do they color? Okay. Do they use like really fun colors for really, so like, like do they make the cow purple? Always, always. And they don't stay in the lines. So is that wrong? No. So sometimes people think there's only one right way to do something. But there's multiple right ways to do anything. I'm one of those people who couldn't tie my shoes for a long time. And I have to make two, I still, I'm, six, I'm gonna be 61 this month. Gifts and cards are appreciated. But um, I still make two loops and cross them over. It's the only way I know how to tie my shoes. My grandson watches me and says, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> but I get the shoes tied and I'm, I'm solving the problem, right? So we have to remember there's more than one right answer. Be open, be collaborative, use all the colors. There's nothing wrong with that. And then here we go, celebrate. Celebrate every little thing. That staircase is so big. Right, so we have to start celebrating every little thing. You guys changed dining, I hope you celebrated the heck out of it, right? What you did with your activities, with your direct care partners, celebrate that. And for those of you who really love this whole concept of not focusing on what's wrong, but focusing on what's right, which is really something I'm, I do, um, DeWitt Jones has a website, and that's what it's called, Celebrate What's Right, and it's always positive, and it's always upbeat. So I just invite. And he you has to a new TED talk too. That's really awesome. He does. Yeah. And well, and yeah, it's based on his stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but his website really is great. not about the TED talk. It's just about seeing the possibility and celebrating everything that's right. So, and I'll take it to oh, you. Awesome. So while we're celebrating, Jill, let's celebrate incompetence. Whoo! <laughs> <laughs> so we often think of incompetence as being something that should be avoided, and it probably should in some cases. But there is a learning model that we go through to become competent at anything we do, okay? So the first phase is unconscious incompetence. It's when you don't know what you don't know, okay? So here's an example. I decided uh, probably about a year and a half ago that I wanted to write a book. This is the how hard could it be phase, okay? <laughs> Unconscious incompetence. I thought, how hard could it be to write a book? Really, come on, right? This is, this is what you, some people often have before they get into a new job. They switch fields, whatever it might be. My first time as a, an administrator or a CNA. You don't know what you don't know. Blissfully ignorant, mm -hmm. okay? But then that leads to conscious incompetence. That is when you go, oh, crap. <laughs> this is really hard. And I had that with the book when I tried to write an outline that actually made sense. And I realized, oh my gosh, this is really, really hard. This is a phase that a lot of people go through when they first start in your organization. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to go work at this organization. It's going to be great. How hard could it be? They get there and they're like, oh. This is hard. This is a danger zone. Conscious incompetence is a danger zone because a lot of times people will quit, okay? And, and I actually almost quit my book until, and I'm gonna do a little swear word here, but um, 
Ernest Hemingway, it's an Ernest Hemingway quote, so I can swear because he said it first. <laughs> but he said, the first draft of anything is shit. And I read that and I thought, okay, well then I'm right on the right path with this book, because this is shit. And I actually wrote at the top of the page, really shitty first draft. And that freed me up to move forward. Okay, so think about in your organizations, about talking to people about, we are going to be incompetent for a while, and it's okay to have a shitty first draft. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to goof up. We expect it. If you don't make mistakes, you're not doing anything. Okay, because this is a real danger zone. It's when people can quit their jobs. It's when people can give up on culture change. Then you get to the place of conscious competence. Okay, that's where you know what you're doing. You start to get things under, you know, moving along, but you still have to think about it really, really hard to make anything happen. Okay, that's when your job, a new job, is still really exhausting. I am still not there with this book, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, and then you get to unconscious competence. That's when your job is second nature, okay? You, you can do it, you know, it's like how you drive your car now. You don't have to think about it anymore. This is also a danger zone. Why would this be a danger zone, the unconscious competence? You get stuck in a rut. You absolutely get stuck in a rut. Studies show the longer you've been doing something and the, the more successful you've been at doing something, the harder it is for you to change. Okay, so this could be that nurse that's been with, in the field for 30 years, or the administrator, or whoever it is. People don't want to leave this unconscious competence because you're good at it. I know my job. I don't even have to think about it. This is a good place to have people teach others something new. This is a great place to say, where do you want to go back to being incompetent? Because if you don't, and I'm guessing, you constantly go through that journey, or else you would probably be burned out in your job after 20 some years, right? You're constantly reinventing your organization. And you, you probably go through times, well, you're laying the path as you walk it, so you don't know what you're doing. It's extremely uncomfortable, but, but we have to encourage people to go to this place or we're never gonna make change happen. Who, who any, is this resonating with anybody? Yeah? How about anybody like, oh yeah, I hate that place. I hate that purple box. The oh crap place. We all do. So, but it's getting to a place where you're okay with it. I went to a community um, in Tucson called La Posada. Does anybody know that community? They have been under construction for 35 years. <laughs> Every time they finish something, they're like, well, let's do this next. I mean, they are just constantly bam, bam, bam. They call themselves possibilitarians, which I think is the coolest thing ever. And they said, share that, because we'd love for other people to think that way. Possibilitarians, the why not? Okay, we don't know what we're doing, but we're gonna figure it out, and we'll make mistakes along the way, and that's okay. So go back to your CEO or whoever and say, we're gonna start celebrating incompetence. <laughs> but then explain it to the person. <laughs> it gives people that freedom to start to make change happen. And it gives yourself that, that permission. Okay, when I was, I, A.G. Rhodes um, Cobb just joined the Eden Registry and I was on their call last Friday. Congratulations. <laughs> but one of the things that they said they had to learn was that they didn't understand how many mistakes they would make. And they had to become okay with it, right? So this is critical to remember. All right, now, this is like my favorite thing ever. Theory of diffusion of innovation. Anybody know what this is? I know people that I've been working with know this one. Okay, this freed me, well, all of these things have freed me, but the theory of diffusion of innovation is this, that anytime you introduce something new, you will have a standard distribution of people, okay? This is the bell curve, right? So you will have 2.5% of people who are innovators. Those are probably the people who have the really shiny eyes right in the beginning and are like, let's go, let's go, let's go. You'll have early adopters. Those people are not gonna get on board until they know that the innovators are on board. So Dr. Thomas, which, where is he? Bill Thomas. Innovator, Innovator absolutely. Um, early majority, 
you've got about 34% of the people that are going to wait until the early adopters, and I'll give you an example of this so it makes sense. They're going to wait and see what happened with early adopters, late majority then comes on board, and then you've got laggards, okay? And laggards are not bad people. When we talk about, it sounds like a really bad, tight label, doesn't it? The laggards. What is freeing about this, so, so laggards are people that do, and at least when it comes to this innovation, don't want to do something different and it freaks them out and they like the status quo. So what are things that you might hear somebody who's in the laggard category saying about a change? It's never going to work. We've tried it before. It's too hard. We don't have the resources. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so human nature, it, what voice do we hear the loudest of all these people? The laggards. And that can sometimes, and this is why when I learned this, I was like, oh my gosh, this makes, this frees me up. I would always hear the laggards and say, if I can't get 100% of people on board, I can't do this. Or these people don't want to do it, so this is, it was a stupid idea. If you understand that there are always going to be a percentage of people that aren't going to get on board with it, it's okay. So here's what you want to do is spend your time on the innovators and the early adopters. Okay, so I, I, and I want to, and, and you also have a tipping point at about 18 to 22%, where the, when you get that percentage of people on board, change starts to happen even more drastically. That's why we talk about getting people through certified Eden Associate training and a lot of people. So people, it starts to make things happen. So, examples. And so I'm going to give you guys a chance to stand, stand up and up. sit down. I would have everybody come up, but there's too many people. So let's have an example here because you can be an innovator when it comes to one thing and you could be a laggard when it comes to something else. Okay? So, cell phones. Who in this room, and stand up if you're one of those people, when a new iPhone comes out, you are at the store lined up, you're the first one to buy it? We got nobody in here? Yeah, we do. <laughs> all right, all right. That's probably about 2.5%. Okay? Of our so, group, so stay yeah. standing up. Okay, early adopters, those people are going to ask you, hey, how did that go? How's it working? What are the glitches? But then I might get on board. Who's next? So anybody else going to be early adopters with the new cell phone technology? Yep, That's it. Stand up. Stand You're messing up. up my bell curve. Yep. All right, all right. And then early majority. So that's when you're kind of like, what, what version of iPhones are we on? 10. 10. All right, so that person, so the, the early majority, you, know, this, you might be waiting till version 11, right? So who is, it, who is an early majority when it comes to cell phones? Okay. A lot more. A lot Late more. majority? You're going to wait until all the bugs are worked out and it's really hard to find the earlier versions, right? All right, who, okay, you guys can sit down. Thank you. Wow, look at it, it really works. Okay, who are the laggards with the cell phones? Stand who has up. The flip phone. <laughs> All right, ooh. And that's probably a little more than 60. That's probably about 16%. So I learned from a, a laggard friend of mine who had to go in special order a flip phone that it is hard to be a laggard when it comes to technology, isn't it? <laughs> And so laggards aren't going to get on board. You're not going to get on board with this new smartphone crazy stuff until you can no longer buy the old technology, right? You're going to hold out until the end, okay? So let's do a different example. So has anybody heard about the, I think it's called loop transport? Do you guys know what this is? Okay, so Colorado, we know about it because um, we, I think we were applying to be a test site for it. But it's, I think it's an Elon Musk initiative but it's basically transportation that, look, that works like one of those little chutes at the bank that you put your money in. Oh. Okay? And so here's the deal. You would be able to get, and I don't have the exact facts right, but you would be able to get from like LA to New York in like 30 minutes, something crazy. So you get in this long tube with a bunch of other people and it shoots you. <laughs> It shoots you across the country. And actually in Colorado, we're look, they're looking at putting one in from Wyoming down to southern Colorado. Okay? So, right? So let's just say this is now available, and it's the first run. Who's going to get on there? Stand up. Whoa. My gosh, you guys are crazy. 
<laughs> wow. No, they're innovators. So you guys don't, you guys just love the idea and yes. Yes. don't care if your brain ends up in LA and you're in New York. Okay. All right. Who's going to wait and to see if they live? Stand up. Okay. All right. All right. And you get this picture of how this works. And you guys are innovators. What are you laggards in? Good Lord. You get one of those things at first run? I'm too driven. I, no, I do it all. Wow. Wow. All right. So does that make sense? This is so important to remember because you don't have to. Here's, you guys are something else. You guys, so as the leader, you don't have to get everybody on board. You want to get those innovators and early adopters to do the work. To say, I survived a 30-minute trip from LA to New York and I'm still here. Here, no. <laughs> um, here's an example of, of using this in a community, okay? So at Claremont Park Retirement Community, where I was the executive director, this is the community that was under all that construction. As part of our project, we were changing our check-in system for the people who lived in independent living. So anybody have a community like a CCRC, IL? So it, normally in those communities, you have a way for people to check in and say, I'm OK. Nothing happened to me during the night. And then you know if they didn't check in that they need help. So the way we used to do it at Claremont Park is these are little crocheted rings. They're so pretty that residents made. And in the morning, or at night, the residents would hang those little rings on their doorknob. And then we'd have a, a security person walk the building. And if you didn't have your ring on the doorknob, we'd knock on the door and say, are you OK? And then in the morning, the resident would get up, take their ring off the doorknob. And if we walked through and there was still a ring on the doorknob, we would know, gosh, maybe somebody fell during the night and they need help. Okay, So this is the way we did things for forever. And as part of this project, we were going to put tablets in every apartment. So going from like 0 to 60, right? <laughs> where everybody would use these tablets to do their daily check-in. Hmm? They do that in California. Yeah, OK, and so we were going to do this. This is where we were going to send messages. We are going to do calendars on there. And so our idea was, let's stop killing trees. Let's use technology. My gosh, let's stop walking the hallways every morning and every night and wasting time. So what do you think happened when we introduced this concept at first? These are people who were probably average age 85, 86. A lot of people were freaked out. So people who had retired when like there were just fax machines were just coming into play, right? And they hadn't experienced the new technology. There were people who were 100 years old. And I had one of the volunteers that this community say, and I felt so bad, but she said, what on earth are you doing to these poor old souls? And I thought, well, we're going to do it and see what happens, OK? So we knew we needed to do this. We knew people could learn, because this person, this volunteer, didn't think that you could learn technology when you were older. So because we were learning about the theory of diffusion of innovation, we used it, OK? So we found the residents who were the innovators. We, they signed up for a pilot where they worked with, this was Touchtown we worked with, to refine the app, to do all the work on it, to make sure it was working right. They were the ones that drove the innovation through the rest of the community. They did the training. They found out that when you don't know how to use a touch screen, you don't know how to touch a touch screen. We had to teach people how to tap it. They understood that I have to teach on paper. Like, I, I would have tried to teach everybody on tablets. But they were like, you have to teach on paper when people are used to paper. They did all the training and got everybody on board. And at, but at the end of this, over 90% of the residents were using their tablets every day. I never could have made that happen. Never in a million years could I have gotten all those people on board. It took those innovators and early adopters. So do not underestimate the power of that. Find your, those are the shiny eyes. That's right. Find the shiny eyes who want to drive change. They're the ones who are going to do it. And don't let the laggards get you down. The only time you want to be aware, and well, you don't want to have anybody undermining things. So if you have a team member that's undermining things, you have to address it. If you have a leadership member who's a laggard on the culture change journey and you're trying to make culture change happen, probably that person, we used to say, 
may need to be made available to the industry if they can't get on board. I'm serious, you cannot sacrifice the whole culture. So you, or it may be helping that person under, understanding what their losses are and helping them get on board with they can't, you can't move ahead if a leader, can't have leader laggards, yep. right? Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, does that make sense? Okay. So, Mel, did you want to jump in on, or anybody else who, who's worked with the theory of diffusion of animation? Anything you want to jump in with? No, you're good. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, uh, work-life balance, okay, because that is something, does it, who struggles with work-life balance? <laughs> Everybody, right? And so if you start reading things in recent research, and people are really starting to say that it's a myth to think that you can have work-life balance, that you can shut off work, I'm here at work, and now I'm stepping, stepping into personal life. That really doesn't happen anymore, especially with technology, right? And with the jobs that we have, it's even more difficult because it's people and it's 24 seven and oh my goodness, it's not like you work in a factory and you can clock out and go home and that's the end of it. And we actually, I think we have a perfect storm here of unbelievable stress, okay? So we've got passion, so we believe 100% in what we're doing and how important it is. So we can't just say, oh, it's just my job, Pfft, no big deal. We have 24-hour responsibility and people have access to us 24-7 because of cell phones, email, text messaging. You have masses of people depending on you. I used to feel unbelievable pressure, pressure as an executive director that if I screwed anything up, I mean, I had like thousands of people it would impact. Does anybody else feel that way? Like, oh my gosh, this is a huge responsibility we have. There are dire consequences in our field. It's not like a factory where something might break. People can have bad things happen. People can die. We can have terrible regulatory things happen. And we also want to change the world. So that's like this overpowering, oh my gosh. Is this speaking to anyone? Yeah. I, I would guess, I mean, this, it, it really is a perfect storm of unbelievable stress that we put on ourselves. So let's talk about how maybe we can relieve some of that. So can, can we have a life without stress? I would really want to go live there. But is there anything, is there a life without stress? I don't think so. There is? Maybe there. Death. Uh, death. Death is the only life without stress. Yeah, and you know, even if you think back and people say, well, we didn't, people didn't have stress back in the day because they didn't have technology. And uh, yeah, there is always, have always been stressful times in people's lives. It's just different kinds of stress. And I had a, a realization one day, you know, and I was talking to one of, uh, one of our CNAs, and I was like, God, you know what? If you don't have a job you worry about 24-7, you probably are having to work 24-7, right? To pay bills. So no matter what, you've got stress in your life. It just, it's different with what it is. So, we, so to say we want to have a stress-free life is probably not realistic. And that could be part of our problem. I gotta get rid of stress in my life. And then you don't get rid of stress and that stresses you out. And it, it, it's crazy. So what we wanna talk about is, is managing it, okay? So Sheryl Sandberg said, if I had to embrace the definition of, of success, it would be that success is making the best choices we can and accepting them. So stop beating ourselves up. A lot of times stress comes from guilt. I'm at work and my mom has a doctor appointment that I need to take her to. I feel really guilty leaving. I'm at home with my family and the phone rings and it's work and I feel guilty about not spending time with my family. So letting some of that stuff go and know what matters when, okay? If you're at home and you've got an emergency at work, then you know what, that's what might matter at that minute. If you're at work, and, and you're somebody in your family needs you, that's what matters at that moment. Having this, we should have work in life, I think is adding to a lot of our stress. Mm -hmm. Be present. Wherever you are, be there. I've had a lot of issues with that myself, with being consumed with work when I'm at home. And even if there's nothing that, nobody needs me right that minute, I'm still checking my email. Does anybody do that? Check your email constantly. And that really disrupts everything. So being present relieves stress. 
And don't expect a 50-50 balance every day. It's not gonna happen. So yeah. you know what? Days where you're like, I don't have, I can t you know, take the afternoon off if, and help your team do this, do it. There are some days where you're gonna have to work till midnight, okay. Try to find some balance overall rather than having these, these hard lines. And there's research, okay, then this, this is, this is, it was fascinating to me because I always think that people who are in charge of organizations have the most stress. But actually research shows, there, was, there were studies done at, at factories where they tested the cortisol levels in people's saliva and cortisol is your stress hormone, right? And they found that the CEO of the company actually had less st stress hormones than the people who are working in the factory. Mm -hmm. Why would that be? Control. Stress is about, or avoiding stress is about having control over things. So you can help your team members and yourself by empowering them. Because mm -hmm. the more control people feel, and what does is, what is high cortisol levels and stress lead to? What kind of health problems? Heart attack, yeah, everything, right? It's deadly. So you can help your team members be healthier and be more well by, in, by using the Eden Alternative philosophy and culture to empower them. And then what happens if you empower your team members? What happens to your stress? At first you might be like, oh my God. <laughs> but then what happens? Yeah, you don't have to fix everything all the time. They know how to fix things themselves. Huh? Le yes, definitely, absolutely. So, so giving people control, okay? And then also, you know, understanding there's a lot that's outside of our control, even if you are the boss. So if you run a, a nursing home, even if you're, you're, you're the CEO and you report to a board of directors and they don't give you a hard time about anything, what's, what's outside of your control in your world? The weather. The weather? Yeah. Trump, yes. Um, um, regulatory changes, government stuff, reimbursement, I mean constantly. Norovirus. <laughs> so, so, you know, understanding that the more we can, we can't, we can't control regulations, but the more we can be prepared and say, you know what, I know how to respond to this rather than everything's coming down on me and what are we gonna do? Having plans can help relieve some of that. And responding to stressors, so the A plus B equals C model is all about there's an activating event, something happens, and then you, you see that through your lens mm -hmm. of beliefs, which leads to the outcome. Okay, so when an act, and you, you talked about this earlier, Mel, so when something happens, you have, a, res you have a, a choice of how to respond. But we don't think about that very much, do we? We're just, because we have this lens through which we see the world. And so it can be, you can start practicing this and having a healthy response to things by even in your your day-to-day -day life. So, example, and I've been trying to help my husband with this too. You're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off. Activating event. Beliefs. What do, you, what do you say based on the lens you're seeing things through? Be honest. Come on. What do you, what do you say? <laughs> you say a swear word. What a jerk. <laughs> right? It's how we respond to things. Now, what if you change? So your belief is that person's out to get me, clearly. Clearly that person got up this morning and wanted to annoy me. That's basically what that response says. True. But what happens if you start to say, and you start to train yourself to say, maybe that guy just found out his wife's in the hospital. Maybe that guy's like, if he's late one more time to work, he's gonna get fired. Yeah. What do you think the outcomes and the consequences are of those two beliefs on your stress level? What a jerk! Ah. How do you end up feeling from that? Well, you might feel better. <laughs> <laughs> if I could shoot across the country in a bank teller thing, then it, <laughs> you're on the way to buy a new phone. But you can completely change your stress level by giving other people the benefit of the doubt and assuming best intentions. And so you can start to train your brain to do that right now, right when you leave here. Let it go. You could just let them in. Hey, I just did something nice for somebody. What happens when you do nice things for people? You feel better, your stress levels go down. Pick your battles. Pick your battles.
Yeah, choose your battles. Yeah, and even, uh, and even practice a little bit of, hey, maybe that, you know, maybe this person's in a tough situation. Yeah, so there's, there's a, this light's on. Right. Say that one more time. Your life is in the hands of anyone who causes Oh, that's true. Your life is in the hands of anybody you allow to elevate your stress or raise your temper. Yeah, that is, Give yeah, that's control. awesome. So the other thing that can happen, um, does anybody else have a um, situation where you go home at night or on the weekend and you're like, I'm not answering my phone. I'm probably not even going to respond to text. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to see anybody. Am I the only person that's like antisocial? Okay, let's see your hands. <laughs> There's a few. Okay, because why? You're on overload. You, you've been nice to people all day long. <laughs> My God, and people are exhausting. So we have a tendency to want to isolate ourselves when we're stressed out. But we need social support when we're stressed out because when we're around other people, our brains release oxytocin. Which does what? Makes you happy. Hmm? Makes you happy. Makes you happy. Makes you want to be around people, which brings you more social support. So try, I've been trying to work on this, is even when you don't want to be around people, go be around people. Because that will help you with your stress level. And it will also help you disengage. Um, one of the things um, that helped me during really, really, really bad times at work like bad times, um, because I was always like, this is more than a job. Does anybody else say that? This is who I am. So when something bad would happen, it would just about destroy me. But I actually, if you, I actually, and actually I was in a really tough situation at a community and could not get out of regulatory problems. This is the place we were under construction at the same time, and it was just a nightmare. I would get in my car every day and cry on the way home. I'm like, I'm going to be dead by the time I'm 50. And so I resigned. And my boss said, what are you doing? And then she said, will you just stick around just to help us open the building? Just get us through that. And I did. And then I stayed there for eight years. <laughs> because, I, because that stepping back, and I just had a task to do to get that building open. Let's just do the task, get things done. I was able to stop that crushing, this is everything about me situation. So even though we say we want to be in it, sometimes you have to disengage a little bit and say, you know what, I, at least, I don't know what you guys think about this, but this is, this is what I'm getting paid to do. On those really bad days, does anybody do that, use that trick? Yeah? The mind game, this is what, and, and it kind of helps you to remove yourself from it a little bit. And then my brother um, taught me this, is to just ask yourself, is there anybody who could do this better than me? Because chances are there isn't. You know? So give yourself a break, for Pete's sake. So being your best in times of stress. What time do we have? 3.30. Okay. All right. Do you guys want to stand up and stretch? Let's stretch, but don't run away. <laughs> stretch. Do jumping jacks. <laughs> Fran, you can go to sleep now since you've heard me talk about the amygdala so much. <laughs> it would, and I don't mean, do you want to jump in on any of this? Or? I'm in it. Okay, okay. All right, so let's talk about stressful times and how we can be our best because, as Sue Ellen said, everybody's watching you if you're a leader. And what you don't want to do is be that person who loses their mind when something happens because you're going <laughs> to cause a chain reaction that's really hard to get under control. Okay, so, and are there any like neuroscientist people here? Anybody who's really an expert on the brain? Okay, good, because I'm going to talk about it, and I didn't want somebody who was really, really experienced in it. Um, so, you've got different parts of your brain, okay? So you have the cognitive part of your brain, the neocortex, okay, up here. This is where working memory happens. This is where cognition happens, decision making, strategizing, prioritizing, thinking through the consequences. If I do this, then this will happen. It's also where impulse management happens. So, oh, I shouldn't say that. That kind of stuff, like that filter lives there. 
So this is the logic area. And then you've got the limbic system, or the amygdala, kind of back in this area. This is where the fight or flight response comes from, and I'm sure you guys have all heard of that. Um, this is, the amygdala is responsible for, for emotional learning, okay? And the amygdala is where everything is filtered through. It's 100 times faster in its operation than this part of your brain. And that made sense back when there were saber-toothed tigers, right? Because if there was a saber-toothed tiger running at you, you wouldn't want your brain to go, hmm, hmm is that think. a kitten or is that a cat? Is that thing going to hurt me or not? By the time you thought it through with this slow part of your brain, you would be dead, right? Same thing with a speeding car coming down the street. You want to respond, okay? So it, so it makes sense for that. But what happens is your amygdala just doesn't recognize physical challenges or, or, or threats that come. It also will trigger when somebody's threatening your sense of well-being, okay? The things that are important to you. So your status, or do you feel valued, or do you feel like somebody's bossing you around? Um, do you feel respected? Do you feel accepted? Do you feel safe? Your amygdala thinks that those things that are, when those things are threatened, it's a saber-toothed tiger. So what happens in an amygdala trigger, and so it happens in meetings and things, is, is you have an amygdala hijack, a lot of times people call it. And what happens in the amygdala, the, the amygdala hijack, and you'll know it's happening because you'll have physical responses that happen, mm -hmm. okay? Your heart starts to pound. Your breathing starts to get much more shallow, start breathing faster. Your focus narrows. All you can think about is that threat. Like you don't, nothing else matters. Just that person disrespected me or whatever it might be. Or I'm afraid when the surveyors walk in, for me, I used to have an amygdala trigger. Like, oh my gosh, they're here. And so everything becomes about that. Nothing else matters. So what happens in the brain is cortisol floods this part of your brain and basically shuts it down for about 13 minutes, okay? And all you can do is focus on that threat because your brain is designed to protect you. Oops. So, that was my old puppy. Um, and so what happens is, has anybody ever gotten an email that just ticked you off? <laughs> and then you responded? Oh, and then you hit send and you're like, Oh God, <laughs> oh God. Does anybody want to share their story? Let me grab Who's mic. done that? Come on, we want an embarrassing story. Yeah, oh, okay. we got a uh. I can't remember the story, I just remember it was a really bad choice. <laughs> now what I do when I get that email is I type the email and then I just minimize it and then I go about my day and then I come back and I just delete it. Right, because you know, oh God, what yeah, was I, I thinking, Oh right? yeah, it's not good. No. It is not good, it is not good. And so that, yes. Yeah. We have another. Just one note along that and I, yeah. I, I'm loud enough. Yeah, go ahead. But just one note along that, I've done the same email, I go up there and I erase who it's to. Oh yeah, because you don't want to make right. a mistake. <laughs> just in yeah. case. Yeah. I accidentally hit send. Yes. Instead of minimize. So, Definitely. So before I minimize it, I take out the back, the, the, you know, who it's replying to first, and then I can say all I need to say. <laughs> yep. Excellent point. <laughs> so that what in the heck was I thinking is because you weren't thinking. Because this part of your brain that understands, oh, if I say that to my boss, bad things will happen, isn't working. You don't understand the consequences. You're not thinking about logic and... What, what's going to happen based on this? All you're doing is responding to that threat and fighting back, right? Like it's a saber-toothed tiger or whatever it might be. And so it's really, really important to, to understand that, that this can make us do really, really, really stupid things. Okay? And that's why they say when you're arguing with your spouse, for example, take a breather right. and then you can come back together and talk and be logical because you can't, it is impossible to be logical when you're, you're amygdala is triggered. It's just impossible. But what you can do, and this was my, this was Kirby Von Barkensnort, who we lost this year. But anyway, have you ever walked with your dog and they come across another dog, walk by, well, my dog is not very well trained, so trying to leap at this other dog and then you walk by and then it shakes. You ever notice that? They'll shake it off. They're resetting their body and letting go of some of that stress. 
And we can do the same thing with a reset button. So if we start to recognize that my amygdala is getting triggered, you can do something about it, okay? So ways you can do that. You can, anything to engage the logical thinking part of your brain. So you can go, I'm gonna count down in my head from 10 to one. You can, anything to engage the logical thinking part. You can do something physical. I used to get, oh, I would go like this when my, my shoulders would go up. I would go, and then release them. You take deep breaths. And you know, if you start taking deep breaths and you're in a room with other people, they will start to breathe the same way as you without even knowing it, and you can calm the whole room down. Okay, you can, um, <laughs> when I went to the class on this and learned about it, the, the woman who was teaching it said that she worked with this woman, and they would always use this model to manage their stress at work, and this woman would always be going like this. And so finally one day she was like, what are you doing? And the woman said, okay, so now everybody put your fingers up and put somebody's head between the two and then squish it. She's like, that's what I'm doing to that person. That's the way I reset my brain. Oh, that's so hysterical. you can go back and do that to people and they'll be like, what are you doing? <laughs> so that was her way of resetting her brain. But what, you need to do, what we need to do if we really want to take control of this is understand what those physical responses are so that we know we're being triggered by somebody, okay? Um, so I'll give you, this was one of my, so there are certain people that will trigger you. Yes. This was Mike. Mike was my maintenance director at Claremont Park when we were going through that um, unbelievable time of stress. And Mike, in this picture he did on purpose, like, because that was who he is. And Mike used to trigger me so badly because I had need to be, I wanted him to respect me because I was his boss. Let's just be honest. And I wanted to know that when I asked him to do something, it would get done because it was important to me that when I made a promise to the residents that it would happen. And Mike would do, when I would ask him to do something, he would be like, ah, and he would push back on everything that I said to him. And I would just not handle it well. He would trigger my amygdala like nobody else could trigger my amygdala. And I would say, I would never say anything terrible, but I would lose my temper with him. And then later I'd have to call him and be like, Mike, you know what, I shouldn't have lost my cool. Because he had a lot to offer. He really, I mean, he's a brilliant human being and he's amazing and he's very resident person directed and he just liked to get me going. But I could never hear him because he triggered my amygdala all the time. And so I would shut him down, I'd get mad at him, and then I'd have to call him to apologize, and then I'd be mad at myself and trigger it all over again. And when I went, and so what Mike was doing, he was triggering like everywhere around, you know? <laughs> I, I didn't feel like he respected me. I didn't feel like, you know, he, he appreciated what I was trying to get done at the community, all these things. And when I went and learned about this, I was like, that's what he's doing. He's triggering my amygdala. And I started to real, oops, I started to realize that when, when he would trigger me, my shoulders would go up. So I started going, okay, this is happening. And then I would go, and I would let him down. I actually, it was so bad, I used to get mic grains, I used to call him, because he would make me so, ah. um, And so I learned how to stop it. I learned how to stop it and have a, a civilized conversation with him. And then I talked to him about it. You know, you, this is why this is happening. You're triggering me, why are you triggering me? Please stop it and let's talk about this. And so we were able to, to really work things out and work together really great. And I started behaving like the leader I wanted to be rather than somebody who's reacting all the time. So you have, I don't know how much time we have. We, have, we go to 4.30, Yeah. we? Yeah. How many more slides do you have? Let me see something real quick. Well, well, you, you're going too far. Huh? Well, I just, so why don't we, because I want, does that make sense? Does that seem like a tool you could go back and teach your team? Especially this. <laughs> so it's important to start to realize, and you have handouts in front of you that ask you the questions that you can go through later, um, that ask you what situations trigger your amygdala. So go back and think about, and go back and use, do this with your team. Where do I lose my cool? What, what, and what is it about that situation that makes me lose my cool? Um, and what's my physical response? So how do I start to know when that's happening and what can I do to short circuit it? 
and keep myself in control so I can behave like the leader I need to be. Um, so does that, uh, and again, I really recommend, go back and teach this to your team members because people, I mean, people's amygdalas really get triggered when you're starting to work through change because they're freaked out and they're afraid and it's, it's threatening to them. So if you can teach people about, and then uh, teach people about it, but then also give people the freedom to say to you, Sue Ellen, I, your amygdala seems triggered. Now, and again, I don't think hers ever is. But you know what? Why don't you go chill out for a little bit and I'll take over? So that you can start being human with each other. It, it can be really a powerful tool. Kim does that to me. She'll hear me, she'll hear me typing hard. <laughs> don't hit send. Don't hit send. <laughs> and you know, I, I love this because I thought I had pretty good balance. <laughs> I did. I thought, I've got some pretty good balance, and I talk about it to myself all the time. I have, ba you know, like the affirmations in the morning. I have balance <laughs> in my life. I have all of this. And then I started talking to Jill about this, and I was like, well, there goes that. I thought <laughs> it was pretty good. But I think uh, all of this is we have to start intentionally practicing all of this. So we need to be aware of ourselves and aware of what triggers us, like Jill said. Um, I've got those people in my life as well, and I, I never thought of that. That's so much more fun than counting to 10 or backward. It's just so I hope I see you guys doing that the whole rest yeah. of the time you're here. <laughs> it's the new conference logo. Rise up. <laughs> Rise up. <laughs> But one thing I, I started this, oh, I don't know, five years or so ago, I came across a gratitude project. Anybody ever do a gratitude project? So this totally changed my outlook on life. I always was upbeat. I was always a happy kid, happy adult. Um, I thought I was always grateful until I started the gratitude project. And it, it was a Facebook thing, and it was a 90-day project that culminated on Thanksgiving, so it made a lot of sense. And you had to publicly, daily, share something you were grateful for. And it couldn't be the same thing. And you couldn't single each family member out in order to stretch out your 90 days. It wasn't allowed. So each day, and at the time I was doing a lot of networking, so I was out with new people all the time, some of the same. So I started this. And the first day, of course, I am grateful for my family. Next day, I am grateful for my job. And you go through that, and about day five, you're like, hmm, OK. Um, sun shining today. I am grateful for the sun. Well, by the 20-something day, you're really stretching. You're searching. What am I grateful for? And I remember um, at the time, I was struggling this one day, and I got to this meeting, and I was sharing this. And they started calling me the gratitude girl. Um, but I said, I don't know. I, I kept thinking yesterday, what am I grateful for? I don't want to be repetitive and just say it for the sake of saying it. I thought, you know what? I had an ordinary day. Nothing bad happened, nothing outrageous, but I had an ordinary day, and it could have been a really not good day. So I was so grateful for having a, an ordinary day. Some people don't have that. So I realized that's something to be grateful for. But after 90 days, I think that's the secret number, this became a way of life. And I, there's um, on the back of the sheet with the um, um, language is if you'd like to try a gratitude practice, it's um, just a simple way to do it. But after that, it just became a habit. And it's a wake up in the morning and think about what I'm grateful for. And it can change the tone. It can, it can interrupt that amygdala response. Mm -hmm. um, there's a day I, I drive by a river sometimes by my house. And the way the sun hit it, I'm in Florida. So the way the sun was hitting the river, it kind of looked like glass. And you couldn't tell where the plants were growing or where, you know, because they were down below the water and up above the water. And it was so beautiful and magical, and I thought, that's awesome. And like 10 minutes later, I was in stopped traffic. I was late for my meeting, you know, but it didn't bother me. I had started the day with that positivity. Otherwise, I would have been just like a bear, and I would have caused somebody else to have amygdala hijacks. I really would have. But 
Getting that as a lifestyle can help with you as a leader in your own daily life to have that balance because it totally changes your relationships. You don't snap at your spouse, partner. Tend to snap less, period. At least I do. Um, people just don't tick me off as much. Or I don't react as much to it. So let's, that's more better said. Another practice that I think is really helpful for us to help have that myth of balance fulfilled is being mindful. And I think a lot of times we think we're being mindful, but it's really our minds are just so full. You know? So not thinking about it's it's like um, good listening skills, just being present with the person, being present in the moment, and not thinking about what the next thing is or what I have to do. Oh gosh, I still have to present tomorrow. What am I gonna, you know? You be in the moment now, and it really slows that response rate down. It slows your breathing down. It's, it really helps with that stress level. And I know you said this before, Jill, but I think having the capacity for empathy, again, I think a lot of us think we have it, but we really need, and you did it, you moved in as a resident in the community, we really need to be able to walk in somebody's shoes. Not think we're doing it, but really put yourself in that situation. How would I react? How would I be the one snapping their head off? Would I be that saber-toothed tiger? What is going on in their life? And when we have that really personal relationship with the people we live and work with and we know them well, and you know that they have a car that breaks down all the time, you're less able, you're less apt to snap at them or you know, give that trigger response, why are you late again, you know, and, and come at it from a different angle. It just gives you a different perspective. It gives you that new lens to look at things from. And for me, these are the things that help me have, I think, a little bit more balance in my life and just start out on a better note. And then we get back to oh. Ooh, and unless technology comes into play. <laughs> yes. All right, let's talk about technology a little bit. Thank you. I felt yeah. very calm just listening to you. Oh, thank you. Will you call me every morning? Yes, I will. Okay, good. And we'll do a gratitude project. <laughs> because you're very project. soothing. <laughs> <laughs> so technology, who feels like technology is part of their stress? Really? The rest of you? No? Really? Well, you guys, clearly. <laughs> Jeez. Got the new technology or everything. So there, this was research that was done on how many times a day you estimate you look at your phone in a day. Okay. So 18 to 24-year-olds. Uh, and how it's grown. So 2016, over 80 times a day. Okay, 45 to 54 year olds, almost 40 times a day. I mean, that is a huge amount of time that we are constantly spending on our phones, and they are designed to be addictive, right? The apps are designed that way, and so so we spend a ton of time with these phones in front of our faces, as we all know. And what we do a lot of times, there's actually a term for it. We fub people which is snubbing people with your phone, okay? So you're sitting there with somebody and you're on your phone, either you're sneaking it or whatever, and, and research is showing, like, the, and it just makes sense. Like, this has a huge impact on your relationships with other people and, and the stress level, right? Because if you're not present with people, then you're, you're, you're not engaged, you're not getting that oxytocin, you're not having that social engagement that we all need. Um, but it's, it's a big problem that I have this problem that I'm kind of addicted to my phone, and I, and, and I hmm? And, and your kids do it, and they, they fub you all the time. So next time, you'll be like, don't you fub me. <laughs> They'll be like, what did you say? <laughs> um, and we'll do anything to avoid boredom, and, and so a lot of people think that's why this is a problem. It's not the technology itself, it's that we're unable to be bored. So there was a study that was done where people were sitting in this room, and they could choose to either just sit there or push a button and shock themselves. <laughs> and people push the button and shock themselves because we cannot stand to sit in silence and be bored. Mm -hmm. It's true, right? That's why you, you, nobody anymore just stands in a line at this, you know, Starbucks or whatever without looking at their phone, looking at their phone, because we can't stand to have 
And it's what you were talking mm -hmm, about, mm -hmm. mindful right. or mindful. Right. But we are doing ourselves, uh, doing a lot of damage to ourselves by not allowing that because there are great things that come with having that space and that time where nothing's going on. That's where creativity comes from. Right. From having nothing going on in your head and just being. But we don't allow ourselves that anymore and, and now we have it easily available. Shock yourself. <laughs> I thought that was the funniest thing. And there's actually an app you can put on your phone that will track how much time you're spending on it. It's called Moment. It is disturbing. And every day you'll get a notification that says, oh, you were up 30 minutes from yesterday, and it'll tell you what apps you were on. Were you on the phone? Were you on Facebook? Were you on email? What were you doing? Were you checking the weather? This, can, this is a cool thing to do. Some people look nervous. Kind of counteractive, though. Huh? It's, not, it's counteractive. It's counteractive, it's on your phone. but it can help you start to understand how much time you're really spending on the phone. So it's called Moment, it's free. Put it on your phone, track it for a while and see, see what's going on. Um, so taking control of technology. So it's important to reclaim solitude because solitude is so important for managing stress, for thinking things through, for finding peace in our lives. Okay, so it's not a bad thing. It's not, loneliness is different than solitude. So reclaim solitude. Be present when, with others when you're there. I mean, that, that's absolutely critical. And this, this work, uh, book, Deep Work, by Cal Newport, is an awesome book about how do you do deep and meaningful work and how do you manage technology and how do you find space to do important work. I mean, he talks about people in there, these uh, university folks that like do amazing amounts of research and writing and people are like, how do you do that? And they're like, I get rid of distractions. Because we think we can multitask, but we can't multitask. It is not possible to multitask and, and really do anything. Anytime you get pulled away, you're losing focus. So he talks about um, turning off email. I mean, you probably can't do, like, you are not, we're not university professors that can say, well, I'm not going to respond to email this month, right? We would get fired. But, but you don't have to have it on in the background of everything you're doing. If you're working on a project, turn it off. <laughs> Check it every two hours. But every time you go away from it, you, it takes you time to get back into what you're doing. So you, you're never doing quality work if you're distracted. It's just not possible. Um, have device-free spaces. So a lot of people have said, you know what, we're not having phones in the dining room, or we're not having phones in the living room, or whatever it might be, or we're having times when we're not having it, weekends, or whatever, and give yourself a break. Mm -hmm. And then exploring this, these principles of, of deep work. So it's about working deeply. Embrace boredom. So one of the things that I started doing after I read this book is I stopped listening, well, I stopped listening to the news a while ago because that causes a lot of stress. But um, even listening to music, and I would just turn my radio off, no sound on my way to work. And I would come up with, what do I want to solve on my way to work? And I would think about it, and your brain will start to try to go off in all these distracted areas, but if you keep pulling yourself back to what it is you want to focus on, it's amazing. In like a 30 minute drive, I was like, oh, I figured it out. But you've got to give your brain that space to really process things. So again, great, great um, book. He says quit social media totally. And don't tell anybody you're doing it. Don't make a big goodbye world. Does anybody have friends that do that? I won't be seeing you for a month. And it's like, he's like, just go. And probably nobody will notice you're gone. Um, and then drain the shallows. Get rid of the shallow work that really doesn't have meaning and figure out how to focus on that, those deep things that need to happen. You guys have a friend? Does one of you do that? Goodbye. <laughs> so let's talk about the wheel of life a little bit, and then we'll, we'll be done. But you all have in your handout this wheel, OK? So what I would like you to do is take a few minutes and rate yourself on where you are in these different areas of your life. Okay, the physical environment, that would be, am I, do I have a home and a place, or maybe even work, that feels good to me? Okay, how, how, how satisfied with that area of my life am I? How satisfied am I with my career? How secure am I with my money situation? Health, friends and family, significant other, romance, professional growth, and fun and recreation. And then what you wanna do, is mark that number that relates to it and then fill it in. So you almost have like a, a wheel that's filled in. It's probably going to be really bumpy and lumpy. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes. So one to ten. So one would be like, oh my gosh. 
I have no fun at all. And Tan would be like, woo, woo. All right, how are you guys doing? Do you need a couple more minutes? And what I'd like you to do is then think, of, and then based on that, because what you want to have is a wheel that's pretty rounded, right? Otherwise, a wheel that's got like areas that, that are a lot lower is not going to roll smoothly, right? So you want to, to have balance, we need to optimize all those different areas. So think about what's an area where you're really strong. Does anybody want to share? Let me grab that mic. An area? Yeah, Fran. Your significant other, awesome. Thank you, who else? What's an area you scored really high in? Fun and recreation? Oh, good for you, that's great. Who else, yeah? Fabulous. Family? Fabulous family. Oh, fabulous family. <laughs> this is also a gratitude exercise. I know, I love huh? it. <laughs> Personal growth? What about an area where you don't score so well? What's an opportunity? Anybody? Significant, Significant other? <laughs> Health? Ah. Friends and family? <laughs> yeah, when I did this, I was like, I don't have a, as nearly as much fun as I need to have, and I'm not spending time with friends and family. And I need to fix that. Because if, you, if, you, if you're missing those things, you're not going to have a very, uh, you're going to have a very stressful life. So what are two things, and if you would, just really think about this, because it's always good to have something to go away with. So whatever those areas of opportunity are, what are two things you could do differently when you go back home to start to address it? What? what? Take, oh, take care of yourself better, and then get a little more specific. What does that mean? Slow down. Mm. Not thinking too much ahead. I guess I'm, you know, constantly chasing my thoughts. I've got chasing thoughts. It's really that slowing down and being present in the moment. I think that's that's what I'm struggling with. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I have to mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. When you said walking, walking is that what you said? Yeah, and and, and research shows that. Being out in nature has an amazing impact on our stress levels. Even just, I mean, they've done research. If you walk inside a building or on a treadmill versus being outside, there it's significant differences with being exposed to that nature. So having some, get it as specific as you can, because if you just say, I'm gonna not be so stressed out, but like for me, when I realized, God, I'm not having any fun, it was like the next time some, one of my friends asked me to do something, I'm going to say yes. You know, have those specific things so the next time something happens, you actually do it. Anybody else want to share? All right, who else wants to share? Don't Who's next? Don't make me volunteer. Oop. I'm going to work on organizing my house. I haven't been home, or we've had more events at work, and it's like overnight. It's a catastrophe. Ah, that can be very settling, can it? So we often think of ourselves as our leadership is only at work, but if we are not whole people, we're not going to be good leaders. Right? What else? Anybody else have anything you want to work on? Does anybody say they're going to download the app on their phone so they know how much time they're spending? Ah! <laughs> Our innovator. <laughs> I want to see your report of how often you're on that thing. I bet it's, that's hilarious. I love it. All right. I'll let you know now if you like. Not that much. You better not have been on it the whole time during this. So there's no such thing as work-life balance. It is all life. The balance has to be within you. So however... And I hope you did write down a couple things to do when you get back home to get some more balance. Give yourself a break. I hope you'll use some of these tools. The more you can teach other people things like, for example, not having their amygdalas being triggered left and right, you're not going to have everybody in your office all the time saying, you wouldn't believe what this person just said to me, right? Because then they're act people are, pe if we help other people to grow, our lives get less stressful too. Right? Anything else you want to summarize? No, I was going to agree with that. Totally. If you, the empowerment, I think, is a big key to it. Letting go of the control, 
giving it away. Yeah. Anything else anybody else in here wants to add that we missed? Or that you just want to throw out there? Yeah. I'll throw something out there. Uh, you should encourage your employees to find ways to give back. Yeah. Um, you know, whether it's through giving them money or giving them a raise or something. Inherited several employees, and you know they're working, coming in at this time and this time and a different day. They're here and there, and how can you do your life like that when you're all over the place? You know, and I'm like, no, you cannot work that much overtime. You can have exactly this much, and then go home. It'll be here tomorrow when you get here. So I really yeah. do try to encourage them to have a better work-life balance. That's awesome. Yeah, we have to help other people too. Anybody else? Questions? Ideas? Stuff that's helped you? No? Everybody's like, is there a bar? Because I really need a drink. <laughs> One Why? thing oh, that will okay. help, Why am I using two? One thing that will help is to go tonight and have fun yes. at Eden's Got Talent. Yes, that, that would be great. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here, for spending time with us. We really appreciate it. You guys are awesome. Oh, thank you. You said you would do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys are yeah. great. Thank you. I